Welcome to the next lecture on wireless communications. Today we will focus on wireless networks. First, a brief outline of the talk. We will start with the basics of networking, which holds true also for wireless networks. Then we will focus exactly on wireless networking. We will look at some examples of wireless networks, followed by the cellular system and how does it fit in from the perspective of wireless networks. We will then cast our eyes on the differences between wireless and fixed telephone networks, followed by the PSTN, the public switch telephone network. Then we will look at the advantages of wireless networks, followed by some of the limitations. Finally, we will spend some time looking at the evolution of wireless networks, where are we headed to. So, this is the brief outline for, of the talk, but of course, we will begin by summarizing what we have learned so far. So, a brief look as to what we have already ca uh, covered. We started off with modern wireless communication systems, wherein we looked at the 2G, 2.5G and 3G networks. We will revisit them today also. We then moved over to cellular concept, the requirement to provide high capacity. We looked at frequency reuse and co-channel interference issues, followed by cell coverage and capacity. We then focused on mobile radio propagation, where we looked at the large scale fading factors, the outdoor and indoor propagation models, as well as small scale fading factors the Rayleigh fading and Rayshin fading distributions. Following this, we covered modulation techniques for mobile communication. Specifically, we looked at linear digital modulation techniques and constant envelope modulation techniques. We also talked about spread spectrum techniques. Having covered the modulation techniques, we moved over to equalization techniques for mobile communications and finally, coding techniques for mobile communications. We focused on linear block codes, cyclic codes, BCH and Reed Solomon codes and also on codes with memory that is convolutional codes. So, this is the bird's eye view of what we have done so far and today we start with another exciting topic which is wireless networking. So, what are the basics? Networks are a collection of two or more connected computers, hence a network. People can share files, peripherals such as modems, printers, CD-ROM drives, etc. When networks at multiple locations are connected, people can send email, share links to global internet or conduct video conferences in real time with other remote users. So, a lot of basics pertain to non-wireless, that is wireline networks, but now these can be easily extended to wireless networks also. So, what are the basic components that are required for wireless networks or any kinds of networks? So, first of all, we need at least two computers. When I say computers, these are computing devices. So, I can also form an ad hoc wireless network, where each one of the components is a small microcontroller. So, when I say computers, they are processing units. So, I can have wireless ad hoc networks, I can have sensor networks, which are emerging technologies in wireless networks. A network interface on each computer, which we define as a device that lets the computer talk to the network, usually a network inf interface card NIC or an adapter. In general, this may not be a card, but could be just an interface. Of course, we need a connection medium, which could be a wire and also the air, which is for the wireless communication channel. Network operating system software, this is the final thing and these can be many kinds, but basically this is the software, which implements the network layer and above layer protocols. So, here is a simple example, where I can have PC 1, 
a network interface card or a cable that can go into it or another PC and a software which controls all of this. And I can have all of them being connected wirelessly. So, if I am using Bluetooth for example, I can form a Pico net wherein I can connect up to 7 devices wirelessly. When I talk about ultra wideband communication systems and we start talking about a wireless desktop, then what I mean is my keyboard, my mouse, my printer, my projection device all are connected wirelessly. Hubs. Most networks, even those with two computers, also contain a hub or a switch to act as a connection point between the computers in the network. It is a generic definition. In wireless networking, mobile switching center acts as a central hub. This is an example. We have come across mobile switching centers in our previous discussions. We will revisit it later today. Hubs or repeaters are simple devices that interconnect group of users. What do hubs do? Hubs forward any data packets including emails, word processing documents, spreadsheets, graphics, print requests, etcetera that they receive over one port from one workstation to the remaining ports. So, it is a forwarding device. So, I can use a hub to connect to my access point wherein I can give services to locally wireless local area network. All users connected to a single hub or stack of connecting hubs are in the same segment sharing the hub bandwidth or data carrying capacity. So, the bandwidth is shared. As more users are added to a segment, they compete for a finite amount of bandwidth devoted to that segment. So, you have to take this into account. Switches. Switches are smarter than the hubs. So, these are hubs with some intelligence and these offer more dedicated bandwidth to users or groups of users. A switch forwards data packets only to the appropriate port for intended recipient based on information in each packet header. So, the switches start taking certain decisions. To insulate the transmission from the other ports, the switch establishes a temporary connection between the source and the destination and then terminates the connection when the conversation is done or in this case it could be a data transfer, a file download or any such thing. Whenever that is over, the virtual connection is closed. So, a switch is smarter than a hub. A switch is analogous to a phone system with private lines in place of hub party line. This setup allows more conversation at any one time, so more guests can communicate. Basically, it is a more judicious use of the bandwidth. You do not forward all the requests to all the possible ports. You decide who is the intended user based on the header information and then forward the packets. The other component are the routers. Routers use a more complete packet address to determine which router or workstation should receive each packet next. Based on a network road map called a routing table, routers can help ensure that packets are traveling the most efficient paths to their destination. This means that if I am sending an email from computer 1 to computer 2, it will be first broken down into smaller packets and all the packets may not traverse the same path in the network. Based on the congestion and the link quality, different packets might reach the destination through different routes. They will be assembled back and then delivered at the receiving end. So, based on a network roadmap called a routing table, routers can help ensure that packets are traveling the most efficient path to their destination. If a link between two routers fail, 
the sending router can determine an alternate route to keep traffic moving. Routers also provide links between networks which use different protocols. This is important. Routers not only connect networks in a single location or set of buildings, they also provide interfaces or sockets for connecting to the wide area network services. So, any difference in the protocols is handled by the routers. Any difference in the speed of data transfers on two sides are also handled by the routers. So, they form an essential component for wireless networking. Now, we come to access points. Wireless networks can utilize an access point which performs many of the same functions as a simple hub. So, for example, if my lab is congested and I, am, I cannot draw any more wires, I can put an access point and then put these network cards in all of the other computers and create a small local area network. Some access points also offer additional management and roaming functionalities as well. Access points often act as a bridge to wired Ethernet or fast Ethernet networks. Since the access point is connected to the wired network, each client would have access to the server resources as well as to the other clients. So, access points lately have become very popular, especially those based on the 802.11b technology. Installing an access point can extend the range of the network. That is a very easy way to extend your network, effectively doubling the range at which the devices can communicate. So, I can easily add more and more devices to this extended network. So, is the main server, there is an ethernet and then there is an access point and here is the wireless link very useful for adding more number of computers in the lab. We now come to wireless networks. A wireless local area network is a flexible data communication system implemented as an extension to or as an alternative for a wired local area network. So, here first we are talking only about the local area network. Using RF technology, wireless LANs transmit as well as receive data over the air, minimizing the need for wired local area networks. With wireless LANs, users can access shared information without looking for a place to plug in, and network managers can set up or augment networks without installing or moving wires. This is a very big advantage of wireless local area networks. Let us look at a very simple example of a wireless network, a peer to peer network. In this network, each client has an access to the resources of the other client and not to the main server. So, these two can communicate with each other and the definition of at least two computers is satisfied and they form the simplest possible network, a wireless network. So, they can download files from one PC to the other wirelessly. Now, the moment you add the third computer, issues start coming into the picture, because you have to ensure that each one of them are within the hearing range of the other computer. And of course, there is a hidden node problem that comes with it. Let us now talk about network with access points. Access points hand off the client from one to the other in such a way that it is not visible to the client, thus ensuring unbroken connectivity. So, here is a simple architecture. 
we have a main server connected to a PC and then there is a printer and then we have the three access points and here is a wireless network. So, this computer can access either the main server or the database in this PC or give a print command to this computer. Same is the case for this laptop which is connected wirelessly to any one and which one to connect depends on how many computers are already connected to the Pico net related to any one access point. So, for example, let us say each access point has an upper limit of supporting 5 PCs at a desirable bandwidth data rate. So, the moment the sixth computer comes in, it will be connected here. So, there is already a protocol in place which will decide which access point will talk to which laptop. Now, again this laptop can access the server, access the database in this PC or give a print command and also this guy can go through the network and talk to this other laptop. So, this gives a very elegant yet simple method to extend your local area network. Now, let us look at the bigger picture, the cellular system, which is an excellent example of a wireless network. It consists of integrated network of base station. So, instead of having those small access points in the local area network, consider the base stations as a big access points. The base stations are in turn connected to a central hub called the mobile switching center. This mobile switching center provides connectivity between the public switch telephone network PSTN and the base stations and ultimately between all of the wireless subscribers present in the system. So, this is a big version wherein each of the base stations can be looked upon as access points which are connected to the main mobile switching center which acts as a hub. It is usually fair to say that it is more than a hub, it is actually a very smart switch. So, what do we have? We have here our smart switch called the mobile switching center MSC, sometimes also referred to as mobile telephone switching office MTSO. This is the brain. It is connected to different base stations either by fiber optic links or by point to point microwave links. I definitely need a large bandwidth connection between the mobile switching center and the base station. Now, each of the base station acts as a access point and there is a radio link which is an air interface between the mobile and the base station. Since this is a switch, it is connected on one side to the public switched telephone network PSTN right? and might as well be connected to the internet. How they are connected, what is the architecture, we will look at some of the later slides when we talk about evolution of wireless networks. So, this is an example of a successful wireless network. Now, let us quickly talk about wireless versus fixed telephone networks, the pros and cons and how we can improve. The network con configurations in public switch telephone networks or PSTN are static as the network connections can only be changed when the subscriber changes residence and requires reprogramming of the local central office. However, network configurations in wireless are dynamic as the network configuration is rearranged whenever the subscriber moves into the coverage region of another base station 
or a new area. Hence, there is a need for handoff and also to maintain this in some kind of a database. So, as we will talk about the home location register and visitor location register in the context of GSM networks, your data as to where you are present currently and what is your actual home address are all stored. Now, let us talk about wireless versus fixed networks from the perspective of channel bandwidth. The available channel bandwidth in the PSTN can be increased by installing high capacity cables such as fiber optics or coax cables. However, the wireless networks are constrained by the less RF cellular bandwidth provided to each user. This necessitates the requirement for using frequency reuse. What about flexibility? Fixed networks are difficult to change. On the other hand, wireless networks must rearrange themselves for users immediately to provide roaming and imperceptible handoff between calls as mobile moves around. This is an inherent requirement for any wireless networks. If you extend this concept of wireless networks to the emerging wireless networks like ad hoc networks, there you have absolutely no infrastructure which is there. The infrastructure comes into place by the various nodes, the wireless nodes and the network can change very dynamically. Let us have one basic slide on public switched telephone network or PSTN. The PSTN forms the global telecommunication grid which connects conventional which are landline telephone switching centers called central offices with the mobile switching centers throughout the world. Every telephone in the world is given a call in access over PSTN. But here are some exciting statistics. Landline telephones are being added at a rate of 3 percent while wireless subscriptions are increasing at a rate of greater than 50 percent. So, today there is an ever increasing need to have a good robust wireless network which is expandable. So, let us look at some of the advantages of wireless networks. Mobility, it can provide the users with access to real time information. This mobility supports productivity not possible with wired networks. Installation speed, very important factor. Installing such a system is very easy as it does not require pulling of wires or cables. One of the very popular concept is the wireless in the local loop or WLL, where we solve the last mile problem. We can take the fiber connection to the curb, but not to every home, because it is not cost effective. At least it was not cost effective 5 years back. At that time, the fiber was brought to the curb, wherein a tall tower was erected or put on top of a building and locally within the local loop, wireless access was given. That is called the wireless in the local loop. It can provide limited mobility. Installation flexibility. Again, wireless technology allows the network to be extended where a wire cannot reach or go. In wired networks, if the customer is located at the farthest end, you have to pull a wire right up to that point. Whereas, in the wireless networks, you can give uh, service to the farthest user just by putting a customer site antenna. Reduced cost of ownership, overall investments and life cycle costs are significantly uh, lower than the wired networks as compared to the wireline networks. So, basically it is a cheaper inexpensive technology. Scalability is yet another important features. Wireless LAN systems can be configured in a variety of topologies. This is important to meet the need of the specific application and installation. 
So, if you want to scale up a wired network, a lot of infrastructural cost is required and sometimes the logistics may not be possible. Here we have seen in our previous lectures that I can have sectorization of cells, making cell splits and other factors to ensure I can increase the capacity of my systems, thereby adding more nodes in my wireless networks. The other side of the coin, limitations of wireless networks, dynamic nature implies complexity. So, this is one of the research challenges for ad hoc networks and also for sensor networks, whereas giving the dynamic nature comes with a cost which is complexity, management of networks, right? the links are poorer, the bandwidths are lower. So, all these things have to be considered while you depute a wireless network. All the end users in the network are dynamic. It requires an air interface between base stations and subscribers to provide telephone com communication under a wide range of conditions and probably for any user location. So, wide range of conditions we have already seen in previous lectures. You have a fading environment, it is a noisy channel, you undergo shadowing, there is a foliage uh, absorption, scattering effects, a lot of problems with the wireless channels. For adequate area coverage, there should be many base stations in the area and each of these should be connected to the mobile switching center. Again, MSC, the mobile switching center provide connection for each of the mobile users to the PSTM. So, this step requires connection to LEC, IXCs and to other MSCs via separate signaling networks. So, basically the point is that the mobile switching center has to do all the hard work in terms of connecting it to other networks. This we know already, the random nature of the radio channel is a big limitation. As the mobile changes location frequently, the mobile switching center is forced to switch calls imperceptibly between base stations. Please note that the random na nature of the wireless network could cause another problem. For example, in Connaught Place, there is a, a big uh, festival going on. So, it will attract a lot of mobile users at the Connaught Place circle. And if all of them are trying to access the network, then there will be a big congestion problem. This is attributed to the dynamic nature of the wireless networks. Such kind of a problem is not going to occur in wireline networks. Okay. The radio spectrum or the bandwidth thus available for the wireless systems is limited and they are constrained to operate in fixed bandwidth. So, spectrally efficient modulation techniques, frequency reuse, geographically distributed radio access points become vital components of the wireless networking. So, if you remember in our previous classes, we have talked about efficient modulation techniques, need for frequency reuse, distributed base stations and access points. All of these also form an important component of the wireless networking and the actual networking protocols will take into account what kind of a efficient modulation technique you have, which means how much of bandwidth you have, what kind of error correcting schemes you are using, which means how good is your link quality, right? And frequency reuse and geographical distribution depends upon how much of the users are being covered and what is the congestion level between links. Also note that extra overhead is required at the mobile switching center to ensure seamless communication regardless of the position of the users. So, a slide on merging wireless and the public switched telephone networks. Until the mid 80s, the PSTN used to send the signaling information along the same trunk lines as the voice traffic. The 
overhead required for this process was inefficient as it required the voice trunk to be dedicated even when there was no voice traffic present. So, what was the solution? The advantage of having a separate parallel signaling channel allows the voice trunks to be used strictly for sending voice signals. So, you have a voice network and a signaling network, they are independent. Thus, during the mid 80s, the PSTN was transformed into two parallel networks, one dedicated to user traffic, voice channels, and the other dedicated to call signaling traffic. This technique is known as the common channel signaling. Now, dedicated signaling channels have been used by the cellular MSCs to provide global signal, signaling interconnections thereby enabling mobile switching centers throughout the world to pass subscriber information. The point that is being made is there was leapfrogging in technology. There are separate channels set aside in wireless networks purposely for signaling. So, there are signaling channels and then there are traffic channels. When we talk about GSM networks and CDMA networks in the subsequent lectures, we will talk about two kinds of channels the voice channels and the signaling channels, they are inbuilt. In many of the cellular systems used today, voice traffic is carried on the PSTN while signaling information is carried on a separate channel. So, in second generation cellular systems, the air interfaces have been used to provide parallel user and signaling channels for each mobile. So, the concept has been borrowed from fixed landline networks. Let us spend some time on the evolution of wireless networks. So, here if you see we have on the left the wireless, on the right we have the cordless, it is within the home and outside the home. And then we are trying to track the progress of three geographical regions even though we are talking about countries here, Japan, US and Europe. So, in the first generation, on this left column, we have the first generation, the second generation and the 3G and we are talking about the evolution of wireless networks. Here we have the analog amps and then in the Europe, we have this tax and nets C which is the German and radio com. We of course, had in the first generation the CT1, CT2 and CT3 as the cordless telephone standards. So, here in these ovals, we have put the specific standards which were used. Now, what is important to be noted is that there are many standards. In fact, there was no real standardization across the globe. Every country tried to evolve its own standard. Of course, Japan took a leapfrog and came up with PDC in the second generation wireless communications. Whereas, the US went over to have digital amps and then IS 54 followed by PCS 1900 and then CDMA based IS 95. That was the second generation wireless technology being deployed in the US. At the same time, Europe did a smart move to move over to GSM 900, which gradually went over to GSM 1800 and GSM 1900 technologies. So, these are the second generation wireless network standards. From the cordless perspective, we had the DECT, the PAX, paging and PHS which is the Japanese technology. So, this represents the second generation evolution of wireless networks and cordless phone technology. Again, please note that they are fairly distributed. The only unification that has happened is across Europe when they are following the GSM technology. GSM has been shown to be one of the most successful wireless technologies so far and it has now spanned almost the entire globe. The move to 3G is depicted by 
the convergence of all these arrows. So, the basic philosophy of 3G is to have one world standard. Well, the, there is a difference between having a philosophy and getting what you desire. So, apparently we are working towards a CDMA based standard, but there are again two flavors of it. But this is the general move towards the evolution of wireless networks. Please note the cordless and the wireless technologies also would like to converge. What is not shown here is also the merging of the IP networks into this. So, I can have a wireless phone which can connect to the IP. So, I can make a voice over IP call from my cellular phone. So, in a few months time or maybe in a year's time, we should be able to buy off the shelf a handset which works as a cordless phone inside your home, works as a cellular phone outside the home and if you are near a access point, you will be able to make voice over IP phone seamlessly. You will not even realize which network you are connected to. So, that is where the 3G is moving towards. Now, a graphical description of the first generation network. Again, please note that the cellular concept is there, but you have the public switch telephone network which is connected through the mobile switching centers and then you have the home location register and the visitor location registers and the base stations are communicating with the mobile stations and you need to hand off when you move from one generation to the others. This is the philosophy used before mid 80s. A lot has changed. Please note that traffic and signaling sent on separate trunk thereafter using an SS7, the co common signaling channel which is used to send control information other than the voice traffic. So, this is the evolution after the mid 80s, the inclusion of the SS7 signaling channel. What were the features of the first generation uh, wireless networks? Analog, mostly FDMA, frequency division multiple access based and then you have call processing which mobile to mobile calls, terrestrial to mobile calls. You had some control in terms of power control, power of the emitted radiations and hand of control. Billing was there, there was some basic fraud protection and very limited roaming. Roaming was expensive and not omnipresent. This is a snapshot of how the inside of a mobile switching center would look, it would be a big room. Now, when you move to the second generation networks, again you have the different coverage areas and you again have uh, base stations and their uh, cells which are located. Then you have the uh, mobile switching center and connected to the PSTN network here. Again, you have the concept of home location register and visitor location register and authentication which is being done. But on top of all of this, you have internet connectivity, PDN, ISDN and PSTN which existed. So, the second generation has evolved to being a digital network, more robust and the features are as follows. It is TDMA based primarily, but of course, IS95 is CDMA based. Performance monitoring is there, network management is there, billing is there, smart billing. So, you <clears throat> so the uh, users can have options, the service providers can give you options that you can pay when you receive calls or you can pay when you make calls or you can pay only some part of the money to your favorite calling numbers and things like that, all these billing things can be taken care of. And then uh, at the base station, the call processing is there, mobile to mobile and terrestrial to mobile calls are allowed, we both have power control and hand of control. What we saw in the second generation is higher capacity and mobility, easy frequency planning, dynamic channel allocation in GSM, single frequency band in CDMA concept, 
better performance. How do we meta, measure better performance? Low call drop rate and faster switching. Plus, we had some basic encryption, also mobile assisted handoff and also we had the soft handoff concept in CDMA. We for the first time started exploiting diversity by having multiple antennas at the transmitter or the base station. We used convolutional coding and interleaving as error control coding techniques. So, basically a more robust system as compared to the first generation thanks to the digital architecture. Plus, we also had some value added services. GPRS, the move from GSM towards 3G systems and edge. So, these are the basic benefits provided in the second generation wireless networks. Let us now look at the 3G. So, 3G is a combination of a lot of features which are being promised. So, when somebody says we have a 3G phone, we have to tick mark how many of these features are being provided. So, when you have telephony, you have voice, video, fax, mailbox facilities, voice mail. Okay. Again at the desirable rate, when you say voice connectivity or fax connectivity, you should be able to have these connectivities even traveling at a certain rate. So, even if you are moving in a fast car, you should be able to get certain kind of voice quality or video quality. But then telephony is just one of the three features. You have access to multimedia material, television, radio, infotainment and location services as well as the internet that is you can serve the web, check or send emails and mobile commerce. If you can do all of these things, truly you are in the 3G domain. So, 3G is not only about higher speeds, 3G is about more number of services, better quality of service and better mobility. So, the whole idea is to merge all of these together and come up with one product which can give you the same features. Okay. So, that is the basic overview of 3G. Now, clearly a lot of time and money has been spent and infrastructure has been set up to make the 2G and 2.5G systems work. Now, the effort is to slowly and gradually migrate to 3G. So, in this slide, whatever I have put in green shows the 2G systems and whatever is in yellow is the 3G systems and the arrows show the migrations. Now, there are three kinds of migrations which have been noted. One is an easy upgrade shown by the bold lines and then the magenta dotted line shows the upgrade requiring new modulation schemes and some error control coding techniques. And then the orange dotted lines show upgrade requiring entirely new radio systems. That is, you have to pull down an old base station and put up an entirely new base station, new antennas. So, if you see, let us talk about the European standard which is more in line with what is done in India. So, you had the GSM standard in 2000, the standard uh, 2G network and then the direct move was to GPRS, this is the packet radio service. Here the change was not difficult and today most of the phones, the new phones that are being bought in India also have the GPRS capability. Then you have a simple dotted magenta line connecting GPRS to edge wherein you have to somehow require new modulation techniques to go from GPRS to edge. Now, edge tends to be the first step towards 3G system, but this is not truly 3G. In Japan, the move is towards WCDMA and in the US, it is move towards CDMA 2000. So, the 3G standards will be CDMA based and today, 
both WCDMA and CDMA 2000 are going to coexist. India is going to look at CDMA 2000. Currently, we are using CDMA 2001 X EVDO. Let us talk about the handsets in the next few slides. So, in the 2G handsets, the current digital mobile phone technology is what most of us have seen today and are using. The features include simple phone calls, voice mails, can receive and send SMS. SMS, which was one of the side services, has become one of the main services. People are now spending more money and time on SMS than on regular phone calls as per one of the surveys. Now, the data rate is 9.6 kilobits per second and just to compare, if you would like to download a 4 minute MP3 clip or an MP3 song, you would require 50 minutes to download it. So, the data rates are pathetic if you are going to download a song on this one. Now, if you look at the 2.5G handsets, these are the next generation technologies are now widely available and many of us use the 2.5G handsets. The features are enhanced. You can make phone calls, send faxes, they are always on. There is voicemail. You can send and receive larger email messages. You can browse the internet. You can look, do position location. So, you can use a GPS connectivity and it will fax you or it will send you the coordinates of your location instant news updates, lot of entertainment facilities. Speeds are better, download speeds, it can go up to 144 kilobits per second, provided you are sitting fairly close to the base station with a clear line of sight. If you compare with the last mobile handset, if you want to download a song which is 4 minutes long in the MP3 compressed format, it will take you 7 to 12 minutes to download the song. So, it is getting better but still a lot of it is to come. We desire a lot more. Now, when you move to the next generation handsets, so what is being emphasized in these slides is it is not only the technology in terms of the base station upgrade or the wireless network upgrade, but the bottom line is that the services that can be provided will actually drive the sales. If you look at the 3G handsets, it is supposed to combine a mobile phone with a laptop, PC, television, a PDA and whatever you can think of. Some people are also promising this to be a remote wherein your TV channels can be changed and also a PowerPoint presentation may be conducted using the keypads on a mobile phone. So, the features include phone calls, fax has to be there, global roaming, no questions asked send receive large emails, okay. high speed internet, so you can check your stock codes or cricket updates, GPS services, you can start doing video conferencing. So, a lot of this is not there already, but this is the promise of 3G handsets. Because when my network is upgraded to a 3G network, the data rates can be provided such that I can do a video conferencing live. My handsets must also evolve to handle those applications. Therefore, the need to evolve handsets. Live video streaming. The speeds are phenomenal, greater than 144 kilobits per second going up to 2 Mbps. So, now if you want to download the same 4 minute MP3 song, it will take you just half a second or one and a half minutes to download the same song. Now, now we are within the reasonable domain for true multimedia activities. So, now we can summarize what we have learnt so far. We started off with networking basics. We then specifically talked about wireless networks followed by some simple examples of wireless networks. We saw that the cellular system is an excellent, useful, proven example of a wireless network. We then focused our attention on the differences between wireless and fixed telephone networks. 
followed by a few slides on the PSTN, the public switch telephone network. Then we looked at the advantages of wireless networks and also the limitation of wireless networks. Finally, we spent some time looking at the evolution of wireless networks and also the evolution of wireless handsets. We have now built enough background to look at certain specific wireless standards. In the subsequent lectures, we will talk about the GSM standard and the CDMA standard. That will include concepts of frequency planning, frequency reuse, modulation techniques, coding techniques, interleaving, wireless networking. So, all the concepts that has been picked up will now be realized in a certain standard and we will see how the different pieces of the jigsaw fits in. We will conclude our lecture here.